off. So I'm trying to figure out where the webcam is. We're right about here. So we're right about in front. So if I hold something up for them, hold it here. Hold it for the audience here. Hold it here. Okay. Okay. Um, um, I'm going to be right here. I'm going to try to help out the best that I can. Yeah. I'm stepping away for about a minute. I'll be right back. All right. That sounds good. Okay. What's your name? My name is Ryan. Ryan. So one question I had for you, Ryan. Absolutely. So I was thinking about, there was one point at which in here we have, uh, I was thinking about going, uh, if I'm, should I share? Um, so yeah, you're going to have to reshare your screen. And what's really, if you're trying to use something else, you're going to want to use this screen option rather than the PowerPoint option. So I want to do, uh, if I want to do something else? It, yeah, so a screen is going to allow you to like, you know, go to Google and other stuff like that. Uh -huh. So this so, is where I want to run the but Okay. So right now we're seeing there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and then I wouldn't, uh, so if I close. So what you can do is you can automatically just go to uh, Google Chrome if that's what you're trying to access. Yeah. So if I'm in the slideshow, and then I want to go to um, Chrome. You're gonna, you're gonna click Escape. Yep. Escape, and then I can open this up. Yep. Go to that. And so we're gonna be able to see that video. Uh -huh. The question is. A matter of sound. There's no, there's no need for sound. Right now. Okay. That's, that's your All right. Suite. So we'll be able to see that, which uh -huh. is great. And then if you go back to your PowerPoint. Uh huh. So, so, just, uh, so you'll just go straight to the PowerPoint idea. icon on the very bottom instead of minimizing it. Okay. So this should be able to pull it up. Um, uh -huh. And what you're going to do is you're going to right click on this, and uh, it should have. So it's not an option there. All right, so we're going to go to slideshow then. And then you're going to go to the from current slide so you don't lose your position from the power point. Yeah. Hi, Virginia. Okay. Maybe um, we'll give that a try. That's right before I shift over to Rich. Okay. Just because there um, there is a lot of movement on this, I'm gonna try my best. Um, and then I'll be monitoring uh, this chat option here in case there's any questions to be able to. Uh, um, and you'll be here as well, so you can probably be able to read that. Uh -huh. so. Okay. And then uh, for the mic, if you would like. Uh, I think that'd be more appropriate. Yeah. Are you? I am not. You have all three presenters' names. There's uh, two more presenters. We'll have them on the first slide here. Rich Vanderhoof, Steve Henriksen. Me. Okay, Eric. I'm introducing you. Is what I was told. Okay. I might hit up the group chat if there's something. Okay, great. I will keep it off of Do Not Disturb in case I can run over me if you all. But I'll probably be in a different presentation. Yeah, so, um, but it does seem like I've gone through the test run of everybody. Yeah, so that looked really solid. It's like refreshing. Uh, I'm going to try it. One, one idea that I had Absolutely. Yeah. Really yeah. Is yeah. That because you can slide back and forth how wide the speaker thing is. Like when the other presenters are doing it, you could be like two thirds, one third, and have like two thirds screen, one third them, and then like really scale it back to just a thin little thing when John is or Eric is presenting. Okay. Agreed. Um, Richard, what are the names we have? Richard Vanderhoek? Uh huh, there you go. Yeah. Brian, should I go ahead and go to uh, the beginning of this and just 
start in on this? Yeah, whoever's going to be um, presenting first, is, the, is that you? Yeah. Okay, I think that's um, So from what we tested, I believe um, it's right around here is where everybody can be able to see you. Um, so I believe that this would be the best spot. Yeah, but you see if you've got your camera to the uh, or back to the camera. Yeah. Maybe um, perhaps at least sideways for both people to be able to see you. Are we facing this way or are we staying? So people online are going to see you via this direction. Um, so maybe perhaps, I'm wondering if there's a view of what we see online. Do you see what it's online right now? Yeah, there you are. Um, so right here is right in the middle. Um, that's got you in the, in the shot right there where you're standing in Virginia. I can see your face on the right here. See that? So it'll be, I will. So it's between you and me here is where the yeah. camera is aiming. All right. Sorry about that, Virginia. It looks like it's not going to be perfect, but perhaps um, sideways here. Sideways. Yeah. Yep. So just, you just talk to me, and you're essentially talking to everybody on the camera, and you're talking to the room. Certainly. You can always turn your head a little bit that way, a little head that, that way. <laughs> Make it real complicated for you. Um, all right, so the time is 2.21, so I guess we should oh, okay. probably get started, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, try to close this door. Since this is a 25 minute slide, how much time would you prefer for uh, questions? Uh, four or five minutes if we get, let's see what we get. All right, I'm going to put a five minute warning then. Okay. okay. All right, um, I'm just going to tell them that and then you'll be good to introduce. Uh, for those online, um, I'm just going to put my hand over the screen here to be able to give you a five minute warning for questions. All right? Back with that, I believe you're good. Good afternoon, Ryan. Yuck. Hey, everybody today here at Sharing Our Knowledge Conference, I am going to be introducing the next speaker for remote, and that's going to be um, Eric Hollinger. His Tlingit name is du Dukwu. He's Duck Cloady Man, and he's going to be talking about um, Tlingit Spears. And the real thing is revisiting the lost art of the spear thrower. And he has other um, colleagues working with him, Richard Vanderhoek and Steve Henriksen. I think you're from the up there in Juno. Hi, Steve. <laughs> OK, so um, we're really happy that you guys are tuned in here. And we're having a great time at sharing our knowledge conference. And with that, here is Mr. Hollinger. Good okay. cheese, Virginia. Uh -huh. Sorry, I'm sorry, we brought we brought the middle school class down, but we couldn't find the room. But I don't know if we'll fit. We won't fit the babies. Okay. Sorry. Guys, we're going back. Good afternoon, Kwan. Good afternoon, Virginia. Thanks for having us here. Uh, so I will start off, and uh, and then Rich will transition in the middle, and then we'll pass it on to Steve. So, and I know uh, for some of you this is a little bit of a uh, revisiting, uh, as we say, revisiting here. We're revisiting again. You've seen some of this at some of the best plan conferences, but part of our mission here with this is to continue to spread what we're learning about these Xi'an uh, to raise awareness of them because they are such a rare item in the past and we hope to revitalize their use among carvers and among uh, uh, people learning about them in culture camps and maybe hunters uh, to start using them again as well. So we were inspired by these two spear throwers, these Xi'an, in the collections of the Smithsonian's Museum of Natural History where I work and you can see they are, are we able to lower the lights in the front at all? Because this is kind of just washing out the screen there. I don't know. That down. And there you go. go. Is that a little bit better for everybody? Great. Uh, and so you can see they're, they're a little bit dark, but they are beautiful. Elaborately carved, inlaid with abalone shell. In this case, uh, there are two of them, both from Sitka, collected in the 1800s, and these are in great shape. And so they are so rare, as Steve will explain, there's only a couple dozen of them known in the world, uh, and they are pretty short. They're shorter than would be expected from most Arctic spear throwers, 
So people had wondered whether they were really functional or not, given how elaborately carved they were as well. And so uh, with uh, Harold Jacobs, with Central Council, we decided to undertake some uh, experimental research to see if we could put that to the test. So we decided to replicate them using 3D technology. Here we see a CT scanner, medical CT scanner. They were run through the scanner so we could get them in 3D. And when we did that, we noticed there was a lot of metal in the end of it there that was hard, to, that was surprising to us. You can see a little bit of metal when you look at them, a uh, little pin and a little piece of metal at the edge, but we had no idea how extensive the metal was in there. Then we x-rayed them, which made the images a little clearer. I don't know why that's uh, having trouble transition. There we go. So you can see the, little, the metal in there a little bit better. Doing a weird transition thing. Um, that is the metal isolated with the CT scan. So we actually see two pieces, a metal plate almost, and a staple holding that plate down. So that was really surprising to us how much was in there. And then this is the other one. When we CT scanned it, we found that it also had at least two pieces of metal in that that were, uh, the only function we could think of for these was that they were to reinforce that pin. They weren't just a peg in there. Uh, in that end, but they were something to reinforce it. So that gave us some ideas or questions about how it might have functioned, that that pin was important to it. Uh, we also, the CT scans were a little bit messy because that metal was interfering with the scans, and so we laser scanned them. Here it is, a laser arm scanner scanning that, and that got a good outside shape for it. And the second thrower, and then in the computer, they cleaned it up, and they were able to 3D print these. These were sent away through a company called Shapeways, and they were printed in high-strength nylon. These are some of the first prints. Uh, they weren't uh, great, but uh, they're pretty darn good. And you can see uh, the original on the bottom there, uh, a dyed 3D print in the middle, which we then put to the test by taking it outside the Smithsonian and throwing spears with them. And they seemed to work. They were uh, a little bit challenging because the darts we had were not designed for these throwers, as Rich will probably explain, that uh, the technology associated with these, they, the, the dart matters, the architecture of it, the mechanics of it relative to the thrower, but they worked well enough to show that they could be functional. And uh, here you see Harold Jacobs and Mike McNulty visiting the Smithsonian and throwing spears with them as well. So we like to go outside when people come to the Smithsonian and over lunch we throw spears with these 3D printed throwers now. We brought them then to Klan Conference and held workshops in 2017 and in 2019. Here it is in Sitka, We're throwing spears, reintroducing them to Klan leaders and to, um, let's see, I don't need to escape. And now let's see if we can show you an example of how they work in action from Klan Conference in 2017. is a lot slower than it is on my screen. There must be some delay between my screen and there. Well, since it's extra slow on there, that actually helps, I guess, with the slow motion portion of it <laughs> to illustrate what it is. Okay, let's see. I'm going back to slides. And so the 3D prints, we've gotten a little bit better with the prints. And uh, now I don't know if you can bring the lights up a little bit. Anybody have access to those? And for those at home, I can't really see my screen now. But uh, um, we have 3D prints here in person that I can um, hand around to our audience. Uh, here, if you are visiting us remotely, you're not going to get a chance to throw with these. But we can actually go outside and throw spears with these they, during the conference, a couple times through the conference. Here, you can handle these. These are high strength nylon, so you could throw them off the wall and they would bounce and they would not break. So, these are great for using in real use with kids because people, when they throw with these, if they haven't been used to it, they tend to open their hands and the whole thing goes flying. Of course, if you did that when you were hunting, then your family's going to starve. That's fine. Yeah, these are these are these are for sharing and uh, sharing the knowledge, sharing the information, and we want to encourage people to consider carving these again. And you can see on the the slides there uh, the actual 
um, spear throwers next, the actual Xi'an, next to the 3D prints there. So uh, they're pretty good. They're pretty close to, to what they would look like. This 3D technology shows, in this case, we can 3D print um, utilitarian objects in museums and put them into back into functional use, test them out, try them out again, repair them, and put them in the use. Uh, and now I will uh, right, shift Eric, this over to Rich. Wait, Eric, real fast. Uh, so what you put the butt end of the spear right oh, here? Right, and yes. then what is this? I should have demonstrated for people. Uh, if you can, here, toss it here since it's uh, oh. uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not going to break, it might break my computer, but it's not going to break the spear thrower. So I don't know if people at home can see here. We have uh, in this position here. There we go. That's how it's held. And then uh, down in that slot, like you saw, and then it's thrown from there. So we will transition now to Rich, and he will take it from there. All righty. Hi. <clears throat> Sorry, I can't be there. Um, uh, Eric, are you going to be forwarding these or am I? Oh, Do you have one of those? In that case, then. All right. So, how's that? Can you see my screen? We are not able to see your screen currently, Rich. Oh, oh shh. Got you were on the screen. Your screen. Um, okay, um, so can you see anything that I've got up? We only see your name right now. Um, so I would, uh, from, I would suggest unsharing your screen right now, um, and then start okay. the video. Oh, here we go. I'm sorry. There we go. By doing that, now I can see share screen. All right. Um, I'll be right with you. What I have to do is minimize this and this and um, open this one up. So it's in the background, minimize that and that. Okay, here we go. Share screen. Okay, so now are you starting to see stuff? We can see your presentation, and if you want to be able to share your face, you can as well. Um, Oh, that's okay. It's just old and bearded. Okay. Um, um, you can go ahead how? and share your slides, or sorry, start the presentation on your end. Okay. Already apologize for the delay. <clears throat> um, uh, Eric showed you uh, how the process works. We'll talk just a little bit about um, the physics behind it and move on into uh, historical background. Um, Slideshow. Yep. Sli slideshow to your right. To your right. Slideshow. Up, 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 and to your right. To your right. <laughs> Sorry. There we go. And then, yep, you can just go there. There you okay. go. Now we got a full screen. Good. Thank you. Now, that. That. Thank you. <clears throat> um, all right. So throw real quick. These are digital. Digital images of an individual throwing. This is um, uh, a real strong throw, like if you were throwing for distance. So you, in this case, individual cocks back, takes a step forward, moves that, uh, um, the dart past him. Um, by the way, a spear thrown by a spear thrower, we call a dart. You can see that the wrist is, is starting to rotate downward. Basically, this, the spear thrower makes um, the wrist much longer, so it amplifies that that lever. Um, and there you can see the darts compressed. It's uh, springing off the spear thrower. Um, a good uh, individual using a spear thrower can basically double the force of the throw by using this tool. So when do we first see this? Well, um, 
height of the last ice age. Um, and a little later in Europe, we start seeing uh, archaeological evidences, spear throwers, and images on cave walls. Here's a picture from Lascaux Cave, uh, uh, eviscerated bison, uh, a guy laying on the ground with a spear thrower at his feet, probably at least 17,000 years ago. We think that the earliest people into North America were probably using this tool, not only for Mastodon and Mammoth, but hunting everything else. Um, the first evidence, so, so the spear thrower was probably being used as the main hunting weapon in North America for at least 10,000 years. Uh, the bow and arrow comes uh, into North America, sweeps across the Arctic after 5,000 years ago. It seems to move down the West Coast after 2,000 years ago. You maybe have heard about um, ice patch archaeology. That's the fact that caribou hang out on snow patches in the summertime, and this makes a predictable place for people to hunt them. And for thousands of years, people in North America and elsewhere, people have been hunting um, caribou on ice patches, and occasionally they miss. And that dart or that arrow goes into the snow, gets lost, and these things have been melting out, and people have been recovering them. We have, through this archaeological evidence, uh, um, we can see that around um, 1,200 years ago in the Yukon, people switched from using that lateral and dart to bow and arrow. So we know that uh, at about that time, there was a transition to bow there. But the, the at lateral and dart or yeah, you know, if it's you, uh, atlatl is used uh, for hunting marine mammals, we tend to call it a throwing board. The throwing board and dart has lasted up to the present because it works really well for launching a fairly heavy spear at marine mammals. In this case, you can see the guy cocked back, ready to throw. Um, uh, his dart has a detachable point on the end of it. He throws it at the, at the sea mammal. The point sticks in the animal. There's a line that goes from the point back to the dart. The dart detaches from the point. The sea mammal swims off, but the point stays in the animal and the, the sea mammal pulls the, the dart behind him. It both tires him out and ties him to the surface. A really useful technology and one that has lasted up to the present. Here's a, a picture of a, 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 an Ungan a hunter uh, all cocked and ready to throw. This is a nice picture because you can see his hand that's cocked back. You can see there's a hole in the uh, in the throwing board with his finger sticking up through it. We see that uh, similar design uh, uh, elsewhere and up to the present. Um, here's a picture of contemporary Yupik, Yupik seal hunters in the lower Yukon River. The lower four villages of the Yukon River still use this technology for making strikes on seals. The lower Yukon, um, uh, uh, Yukon Delta has brackish water, so it's not salt water. Um, I don't, um, seals don't float very high and it's muddy. So if a hunter shoots a seal without a dart in him and the seal drops below the surface, it's gone. This way, by um, uh, getting a, uh, uh, a dart point in the seal is a way of, of harvesting them. And I'm going to wrap up here with um, this image. Uh, on the upper left, you have the Tsukpiak um, or Luktik throwing boards. And there you have a, a, a similar a style to the Xi'an with the hole for the middle finger um, right in the center back of the throwing board. Sometimes it goes all the way through, sometimes it doesn't. So um, Lutik being to the north of the uh, Northwest Coast people, this uh, kind of shows connection in some ways to the design of the, the Xi'an. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Steve to go from here. Okay, Steve, over right, to yep. you. I'm, I'm here. I'm going to try to share my screen now. There we go. Okay. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the design uh, and style of 
we get throwing boards. Of course, we uh, going from the accounts of early uh, European visitors to Alaska, there's a lot of good accounts of Alaska natives using um, throwing boards uh, for hunting. Uh, and this is, there's also a few drawings, and this is a really nice one by Mikhail Takanov from 1819, showing a um, Sugpiak hunter uh, ready to throw a dart. And uh, looking closely at a large file of this, we were able to see that he's actually, you can tell from this drawing that the throwing board is a little on the short side, shorter than you would expect for uh, the Sugpiak. And indeed, this looks very much like a Klingit Xi'an that he's holding here to throw this, this uh, bird dart. Uh, so it's interesting in that respect as well. But, uh, you know, there's, uh, while we have a lot of accounts of Alaska natives hunting with throwing boards, um, there's only one that we've been able to find for Klingit hunters. And that is an account written by a uh, fur trader named Andrew Taylor, who was in Sitka in 1788. And I want to quote here from his uh, account of witnessing some boys in Sitka hunting sea otters. Quote, they heave the spears with a short piece of wood with a hole in its end, which receives the inner end of the spear while supporting it <clears throat> with the left hand. Thrusting their spear in front of them, this short machine with great ease and dexterity with the right hand sends it with greater force than if it were grasped and thrown by the hands only. We observed them kill one otter in a canoe. They kept themselves snug in the canoe. The man who was going to strike barely showed his head over the gunwale of the canoe. And when the otter was near enough, he struck him with ease. And I think that's that that's a, a very useful account there, especially talking about how they used the, the throwing board, which might be a key to help us understand why <clears throat> they were using them <clears throat> for the purpose of hunting sea otters. Uh, very few of the 25 uh, throwing boards that we've identified have any kind of documentation as far as where they were from. Uh, there's uh, four, let's see, three in the British Museum that are the oldest as far as the collection date. They were collected by George Hewitt with Vancouver at Cross Sound between 1790 and 1795. And the only few, there's a few other documented boards and they were also collected early during the maritime fur trade period of the late 18th century and early 19th century. And uh, we, we uh, feel that the, the carving on the boards is of a style that we think of as old style carving, Klingit carving <clears throat> that may have uh, petered out uh, by the mid uh, 1800s, they shifted over to a, a more modern style. So these boards seem to have been made early and they stopped making them entirely by the mid 1800s or so. So, okay, I'm gonna speed things up here a bit. So this is a, a key board that was collected by uh, George Emmons at Sitka and he wrote, um, that he, he figured that the Klingets actually adopted the, the use of throwing boards from the Alutic or Sugpiak hunters that were sent down to uh, Klingit country by the Russians. And uh, that's where the Klingets picked up this technology. They probably had it before and may have picked it up again specifically for hunting, for participating in the Russians' uh, sea otter hunting activities. The Alaska natives uh, were really key to the, the Russians' business model in the fur trade because the Klingets' uh, technology and other Alaska natives' technology for hunting sea mammals were superior to the Russians. Um, so the Peabody Museum at Harvard has four early boards, all of which were collected be before 1821. And these are all, most of the boards we've seen, in fact, are very worn over all the surfaces. And you can tell that uh, in this um, image and also in the, in the actual 3D print, you can see how worn over the carving details are. And this may be because 
uh, they were considered heirlooms and passed between generations and were used for a long, long time. And uh, so that, that could possibly be the reason for the wear. This is one of the most exquisitely carved ones in existence. Um, and uh, <clears throat> uh, one of the, the, the detail on the right shows the carving just above the finger hole that has a bird of prey holding a otter in the talons and the, the otter is uh, just on the edge of the finger hole and that may symbolize passage to the next world. So this is kind of a, a symbol of the taking of otters by a, a, a bird of prey and birds are the most common figure on the carved on the Xi'an and they, uh, they were especially powerful hunters and this may have uh, the Klingit hunters may have appreciated having imagery of seabirds on it because they were great hunters and they could uh, work well on land, sea, and in the air. So they're very, very powerful spirits. <clears throat> and uh, finally, um, <clears throat> some of the throwing boards, maybe half, show imagery either an of animals like land otters, um, or, or scenes like on this one where you have two pairs of creatures that are sharing tongues or biting tongues. And this is a, a symbol that shows up in Klingit uh, shaman's artifacts a lot and also in things like raven's, raven rattles. And it, <clears throat> it's said to, um, to uh, symbolize the sharing of knowledge or, um, or passing of, of power from one creature to another. And so there is this uh, possible connection to shamanism too, which Bill Holm, who wrote about these uh, Xi'an very early, uh, felt that it was likely that these boards were not actual functional hunting tools at all. They were actually from uh, the material, the tools that shamans used to engage in combat with uh, evil spirits. And there, there's a lot of charms and weapons and other things that uh, shamans specifically used for that purpose. But through the <clears throat> new technology, I think we've proven that these uh, could have been used at least for hunting and probably were given the, you know, the evidence from the Smithsonian boards that have the, the reinforced end with the metal uh, plate and, uh, and, and uh, nail that's in there. So um, at any rate, uh, that pretty much sums up um, what uh, what we were thinking, and again, I'd like to say goodness cheese to the organizing committee, the, the, all the volunteers in the audience, and we'd like to open the floor for any questions. Uh, give a recap, we are running late on time, however, there is a break, so if you guys would like to be able to ask any questions to presenters, please do so now. And I'm here, so you can always corner me later if you don't want to ask on camera. <laughs> so do you think the birds of prey thing could also just represent someone's clan, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. Like, because there's ravens and then there's eagles. Like, I can't go and use a raven at a level. Like, I'd have to use, like, the eagle. Steve, did you hear that question? Uh, no, could you repeat it, please? Uh, it, I was just thinking the representation of, like, the bird of prey or whatever could just represent someone's clan. You know what I mean? Like, because there's ravens, right. there's, you know, different. Yeah, I mean, that that would be uh, a classic interpretation of any kind of crest uh, on an object would be that it represents a clan crest. It, absolutely. It's uh, it's just that some, there are some, uh, if those are crests from, like, clan crests as opposed to carvings of spirits, things like uh, land otters or don't, doesn't seem to be, they're not that commonly depicted on Klingit artifacts, except in shaman's material. But I, I understand that there is a clan that has otter, an otter crest, at least one of them. I'm not sure which one. We have another one? Yeah, what do we know about the darts that they're throwing? Do we have any collections to examine? <laughs> That's a rich question. <laughs> well, <clears throat> we can tell you what they probably look like, but we have no examples um, at all 
that that we can point to. They were probably uh, reasonably short, probably yeah. under four feet, and and uh, not super heavy, but heavier than a, a normal arrow, because uh, uh, even a throwing board, even a short throwing board, um, manages uh, to to handle weight better than arrows do. There were some bows that that had um, arrows that shot little harp, you know, um, were like real short darts with a um, with a, a barbed or point on the end of them. But the a little short, even a little short uh, throwing board handles a dart better. But again, they were reasonably short. We we don't have any examples. Found found in the ice patches. Some of them are pretty. Well, um, the Yukon uh, ice patch darts are for hunting land mammals. Um, There's sort of a separate thing going on there. And all of them that I'm aware of, and I'm reasonably uh, familiar with those, uh, tend to be fairly, fairly long. Um, There's some that are broken, so um, they might not look very long, but then we're only seeing part of it. Uh, most of them are running. Um, say a meter and a half to two meters long. So, you know, five to six and a half feet or more long. There's a place called um, McBride Museum and then the George Johnson Museum. They have a lot of collection stuff that's hidden in the back. And our museum in Tesla is directly linked to the coast here. So we have some pretty unique stuff in there, but I haven't seen the whole collection and a lot of stuff was brought inland. Uh, no, I'm not familiar with those. Um, would would love to uh, to look at them. Are there collections online? No, but but I've seen actual arrowheads, a collection of arrowheads sitting in a friendship center, sitting mm -hmm. on it was, it was on the wall, and they were like just sitting in the sitting inside the little holes or whatever. But actual arrowheads. With the blunt, sure. With the bird, sure. well, the bird blunders on there, but so there must be something that somebody brought in, brought in inland, because we have some pretty strange, strange stuff there. Okay, I think yeah, that's that's cool. I'm, uh, Rich, I will try to connect you with this gentleman. Uh, I'll give him my card, and, and we can see if we can uh, talk more during the conference, and uh, we'll make sure that 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 you can uh, link up on the information to carry it forward. See what we can do with additional research in that area. Thank you, everybody, and uh, there will be opportunities to throw spears outside uh, at some point during the conference, so uh, uh, keep an eye out and uh, give it a try. Wonderful. Good exchange. Thank you. Good exchange. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Steve and Rich. Thanks, everybody. See you.